so good. You've been so, so good. You've been so, so good. Oh, oh Lord, you've been my soul. merciful God we thank you for all that you have done for us we thank you Lord for all that you have kept from us we thank you Father for giving us what we don't deserve and not giving us what we do deserve Father we thank you for your precious Holy Spirit who leads us and guides us in the way of all truth we thank you, Father, for such a great salvation that holds us and keeps us from the penalty and pressures of sin. Father, we thank you for just being God and being God all by yourself. Father, we praise your name because you are the only true wise and living God and you're the only one worthy of glory and honor. Father, we lift you up now. We ask, Father, in the name of Jesus that you would let us witness that you would still bring in salvation to the lost. Let us be a part of strengthening the backslider. Let us be a part of your worship and your praise, by Father, by leading others to the saving knowledge of your son, Jesus Christ. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that Calvary be preached throughout all the world today and that men, women, boys, and girls come and say, what must I do to be saved? And I pray, Father, that you cover them with your blood. And I pray, Father, that you will be pleased with not just this service, but every door that's open in your name. Father, have victory. Father, have glory and honor. And Father, we pray that it is to you, both now and forever. And it's in your son Jesus' name that I pray this prayer. And all of God's children say it together. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. It's a privilege to just be able to say thank you, Lord. It's a precious privilege 
it's a gift that unfortunately has not been given to all men just to those who have confessed and believe we're the only ones who can say thank you Lord because in, the, in order to call him Lord he has to be your Lord now he doesn't need you to call him Lord to be Lord because he is Lord but we have this precious privilege and might I say it this way my Lord and my God amen I said we'll never understand on this side of Calvary what all he means to us how precious is the Lamb of God. I ain't going to get the emotion of the day. I got to preach now. But it does something to me when I just think about all the gifts that he has bestowed upon his children. He's done enough in my life to where now I can rejoice at what he does for others. I've sat under the window and he's poured me out blessings. I don't have storehouses to put them in. I have no room to receive them. He saved me. He saved me. Because of him, you have an eternal relationship with him, the perfect one, the one who makes no mistakes, the one who has no guile in him. He loves us. It feels good when my mama loves me. It feels good when my daddy loves me. But they're limited. It's only so much they can do. See, mama can pray for me. My wife can pray for me. But God can answer the prayer. Turn with me to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. I'll be reading verses 10 through 13. What a wonderful God we have. Luke chapter 13, start at verses 10, reading through 13. <clears throat> and he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath day. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity, 18 years, and bowed together and could not, could in no way lift herself up and when Jesus saw her he called her to him and said unto her woman thou art loose from thine infirmity and he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God I'm going to preach for a little while about how to get loose How to get loose. Very interesting account that we have before us today in the scripture. 
teaches us that there was one who came to church who was a faithful goer of church but still bound bound with a infirmity for 18 years now we don't know how long out of the how much out of the 18 years she was worshiping on the sabbath but we know this day she was at the church house and we also know this day she got loose this woman as the scripture said came to the synagogues, one of the synagogues, and she came on the Sabbath day. And we've learned from further studies that it was not abnormal for everybody to come and frequent the synagogues. The synagogues were a, were a form of a church, but it was also a form of a social gathering or social place. The, Synagogues were the places that were instituted in the cities and around about that people would congregate and get the news of the day. They would get what's going on in this side of town and what's going on in the other side of town. That's where they did their political discussions. That's where they had social meetings. But it's different when they gathered on the Sabbath day. On the Sabbath day is when church service was being held. That's where the priests would come in and the teachers would come in and read the word of God and expound on the word of God in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. But here we find that this day there was one who came to the synagogue who had a spirit of infirmity for 18 years. And don't look at this woman strange, because there are some of us who have had a spirit of an infirmity for much longer than any 18 years. But we learn from the text today that if one has an infirmity, if you want to get loose, you ought to come to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. All right, all right. And you know what the Sabbath day is. said, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. But you know, I've learned something. I serve a God who is the God of the Sabbath. And every day he's holy. So can I tell you my little old take on the situation? You ought to be able to come to God on any day. Because he's the one who made every day. He's the one who spoke this world into existence. And he used seven days to do it. But and last I checked, he was God and he was holy every day of the week. So if you want to be loose from your infirmity, then you ought to come to God and treat him and respect him as the Sabbath. But here again, I'm trying not to give it up to you. I don't have to preach this long today. But I will if I have to. Act like you don't know what I'm talking about, and I'm going to wait until you hear me. But here, today is the Sabbath day, and you're in the synagogue, and you ought to do like this woman who had this infirmity, for, spirit of infirmity for 18 years. You ought to come expecting something. And you ought to let the preacher know that you're expecting something. Open your eyes and raise up your head. Get out your pen and paper and do some writing because it's what's going on in the synagogue on the Sabbath day that loosed this woman from her infirmities. And again, in, if those of us here today who have the spirit of an infirmity, you ought to do like this woman did. You ought to come in expectation of being loosed from your infirmities. And maybe you've been coming for 18 years. And you hadn't been loose from your infirmity. Let me say something else to you that we notice in the text. She was still prepared to come next Sabbath day too. In other words, you ought to come until you get your breakthrough. And some of us may be here today have gotten their breakthrough. 
and just hadn't realized it. Because some of us still hadn't paid close attention to the text. It said that the woman had a spirit of an infirmity. Didn't say she had an infirmity. She had the spirit of an infirmity. Well, let me dive off into the text a little bit because this is a show enough good one, y'all. This woman comes to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, 18 years, going through her situation. But can I tell you something that I noticed in the text? I noticed in the text, when you look in verse number 12, or 11 or 12, I believe, she came to the synagogue, and I believe I'll read it for you, and start in 11. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years, and bowed together, and could not lift herself up. Let me tell you about being bold. What being bold meant she was bent down. She was bent over. And she could not bring herself up. Meaning that she had a spirit of infirmity that bent her over so tough that she didn't have strength to lift herself up. Y'all should already know where I'm going with this thing. There are some things in our lives that have caused us to bow. And we can't lift ourselves up. Well, maybe I need to define bowing. You don't quite understand what bowing is. That's, that's, I told you I'm a country boy. And we used to buy lumber to build with. And the first thing you have to check for was, the, was if the wood was bowed or not. You don't want straight, I want bowed wood. Because you're going to have a crooked wall. And can I tell you what bows the wood? What bows the wood is water and sunlight. The wood would sit outside and if it rained on the wood, then after the sun came up, it would cause the wood to bow. And so then you didn't want that wood, we would throw that to the side. A lot of times the, the, the manufacturer would try to sell it to you at a discounted price. But I'm going to tell you something, bold wood ain't good for nothing. The only way you want a crooked piece of wood is if you're anticipating a crooked wall. So you don't need bold wood. And that's the same thing with us today. Let me bring it home to the people here that are here today. Some of us are bold, but we still made it to the house of worship. Some of us are bent over, and we can't do things like we want to do. And then I, it also says that she was bold so bad that she didn't have strength to lift herself up. Can I tell you something? It's something that's got you broke down. And you ain't got enough strength to get yourself up. That's why you ought to bend down and make your way to the house of God. Because it's only God who can straighten you up. But can I tell you how we've been bold? We've been bold because some of us are bold over backwards. You know what that means, don't you? We stand up with our chest stuck out and our head held back. You bold over in case straighten yourself up. Can I tell you how you got like that? From the pride of life. You know how it is. You got your chest stuck out so big that can't nobody tell you nothing. And then you realize that you got your head up so high you can't consider what's down beneath you. And before you know, you know pride coming before fall. If you hold your head up too high, you're going to trip over some trouble. And you know, the God, God tells you he's the light of the world. And he's a lamp unto our pathway and a light unto our feet, or however that scripture goes. But you can't walk through the path with your head up high. You can't get down to straight and narrow and having the pride of life in you. And then others are bold in a different direction, some to the right and some to the left. You know how it is when you keep your head turned all the time because you can't look nobody in the eye. You got a bold and you got a crook in your neck. And my daddy used to always tell you, when a man can't look you in the eye, he definitely going to lie to you. He don't plan on telling you the truth because he's not showing strong character. You ought to be able to stand flat-footed and bold and look one square in the eye and say what you mean and mean what you say. But because you got sin in your life and because you want to hustle and cheat folks, you got a bow in you. And can I tell you what happened? It's because you got water on you, and then the sun starts shining on you. And you know what water is, don't you? Water is the word of God. When they put that water on you, and you don't plan on doing right, and then the sweet sunshine 
of the Holy Spirit is going to shine on you and it's going to draw you or it's going to drive you. And if you don't want to get that pride out of your life and you don't want to get that sin out of your life, the word of God and the sunshine of his Holy Spirit is going to cause you to have a crook in your neck. It's going to cause you to stand in the way because the Bible teaches us that if you stand in sin too long and refuse to listen to the word of God, he's going to give you over to a reprobate mind. In other words, you're going to have a bow and a crook in you that won't lead you toward Calvary. I'm going to talk about being bowed up to Calvary after a while. But right now, that's what the scripture is teaching about this lady. She was bowed. She was bent over. She couldn't get herself up. But let's see what happened to her. She made it to the church house on the Sabbath day, coming in anticipation of worship. And we noticed something a little different here. She was not the only one at the church house. It was plenty of people at the church house. And this was not the first time she had come to the church house. And since it was not the first time at the church house, we have to ask the question, why? Did she have to suffer it for 18 years? And can I tell you something? Sometimes you come to church, but you still ain't co close enough to be straightened up. Amen. This woman came to the church house time and time again, and she was in the crowd with everybody else, but she never got her deliverance. Y'all ain't catching that. She's at the church house where God is. And the word of God is being preached and taught. But she's still bowed and broken over. This is getting good, so I'm trying to hold it as long as I can. But this day, she got to the church house. Everybody was there like normal. The word of God was being taught like normal. But this day, if you read in the text, it says that this day, they called her name. I told you too many folks come to church, but then they don't get close. They still ain't close to God. Let me, let me, let me stay with the text for y'all before I lose you. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, woman, thou art loose. Let me break that down to you. She'd been coming to church. She'd been faithful just like everybody else. But this day something new happened. He called her. And told her to come to me. And then he said, woman, thou art loose. Many of us have been coming to church. But when God calls you, you're not coming to him. There are many of us that are at church and still bowed and bent over. And God has been calling you. You just hadn't made the extra effort. It's one thing to come to church, but it's another thing to reach Jesus. Well, let me deal with the spirit of infirmity. You do know what a spirit of infirmity is, don't you? The spirit of infirmity is not an infirmity. It's a spirit of infirmity. I'm going to say it again. I'm doing my best. I'm going to slow this down. She had a spirit of infirmity. It didn't say she had an infirmity. She had a spirit of infirmity. Can I tell you something? We got my, we got my, 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 my workout uh, teacher here today. And he'll tell you, and I believe he'll concur with me today. Sometimes your mental will hinder your physical. You can think yourself to be sick and then make yourself sick. With me, I, I'm just using myself. I was kind of proud of myself when I looked in the mirror. I don't have a whole lot of weight that I need to lose. And it ain't really about exercising. It's about dieting. And the problem with my dieting is up here. I've been telling myself I just can't do it. All right. <laughs> and because it's up here saying that I can't do it, my body ain't doing it. 
She had a spirit of infirmity. Well, let me, let me, let me, let me get back to 2019. There are a lot of people at church. They're not caught up in sin. They're just broken from their past sin. A spirit of infirmity. Meaning she wasn't, didn't have the infirmity, even though she was bold and bent over. She was broken down. But she wasn't under the penalty of sin because she had been relieved from that. She just couldn't let the spirit go. Many of us have come to church and we keep asking God to forgive us. You've already been forgiven. You just can't let the spirit of the sin go. Cast your cares on him for he cares for you. Lay it all on the altar and leave it there. Because if you don't lay it down, the spirit of the infirmity is just like you still have the infirmity. I wrote this down because I thought I was going to forget it. Spiritual infirmity, the spirit of infirmity is being spiritually deformed, causing you to be physically bold. When you're spiritually unstable, it'll cause the, the effects will show in your body. Y'all tough crowd today. If your mind ain't right, he said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The reason he asked us to let this, his mind be in us, because our mind is warped. And as long as our mind is warped, your actions are going to be warped. She came to church, but she didn't come to Jesus. That's why when she came this day, she heard something different. When she got there this day, he, she said, I saw you in the crowd. Come on up here, and I got to ask a question. She's been coming for 18 years. He's been calling and calling and calling, but this day she heard him, and she came to him. I've got to ask the same question in here today. You've been asking for forgiveness every time you walk up here and offer up a prayer. Don't you know that God heard you the first time? Quit punishing yourself by keep going over and over and over and over again. That's the spirit of an infirmity. Watch what he says. Woman, thou art loosed. Not woman, thou art delivered. Not woman, thou art healed. You know, he said that throughout all of the Bible. The faith has made you whole. But today he said something different. I don't even believe it's recorded anywhere else. He said, woman, thou art loosed. Why didn't he say, woman, thou art healed? Woman, thou art delivered. Because she was already delivered. She just couldn't let it go. <laughs> there are a lot of members that God has blessed and forgiven. But you just can't let it go. Let me, let me, let me touch on some situations. Some of you have been in some bad relationships, and it's over now. And you prayed about it, and God has taken care of it. But you can't get into another relationship because you can't let that last one go. Let me tell you what a rubber meets the road. I know what I'm going to put up with a man and what I ain't going to put up with a man. And you base it all on the fact that you once had a bad man. Right, right. Same thing with us men folk. I ain't picking on the women today. I'm talking about the men folks too. Well, I ain't taking that woman. Mm. She don't want to cook and she don't want to clean. Mm. And the only reason you saying that is because the last one wouldn't cook and wouldn't clean. <laughs> and the reason she wouldn't cook and she wouldn't clean is because you wouldn't get up and go to work.
She can't wash dishes if you sitting around making them dirty all the time and laying them on the floor. Won't get up and put them up because you playing a video game. She ain't got time to clean up the house. Every time she make up the bed, you go jump right back in it. Every time she sweep up, you mess up. Amen. Amen. I, if I'm going to wake you up one way or the other. But because we can't let the spirit of the infirmity go, it has caused us a multitude of problems. Day in and day out. And can I tell you something? When the spirit of the infirmity get on you, it will not allow you to operate in the work of the Holy Spirit. You do know that you can't pray well if your spirit is broken. You know you can't really talk to God if the evil spirit is on your shoulder. You know you can't worship God if the evil spirit has control of you. Those who worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. But if the evil spirit has a hold of you, you know that's not a righteous spirit, don't you? You know the purpose of the spirit of an infirmity, don't you? It wants you to think that you're sick. Not only does it want you to think that you're sick, it wants you to think that you can't be healed. The spirit wants to be in your mindset and have you believe that you can't be made well. And see, y'all hadn't even caught that yet because she never was, she wasn't sick. And you, and you, it's thinking you, you thinking that you can't get made whole and can't get made well. You ain't sick no way. It's got you thinking that you can't get to heaven because you've been acting bad. And you know from God's word, you ain't going to act good enough to get in heaven. Let me make this thing plain. I'm trying to be third grader here today. You get into heaven because of the work of Jesus Christ and by his blood. But you sitting here feeling bad and won't talk to God so that he can elevate you and take you to the next level because you're sitting there thinking you unworthy. Well, let me tell you something. You are unworthy. But you didn't learn that from the devil. You learned that from God. He already told you and showed you that you was unworthy. But can I tell you what else he showed you? He died for you. In other words, whatever you come in here with, whatever infirmity or spirit of infirmity that you come in here with, you ought to leave it at the altar and go on and worship and praise God because he already knows that it has already bowled you over that you cannot stand up straight. But can I tell you one who can make things straight? It's the same one who can take a crooked stick and make it straight. It's the same one who says narrow is the way. It's the same one who bowed down one one time when he went up on a hill called Calvary. I'm ready to close now. He bowed down one time for us and one time only. He came down through 40 and two generations. He bowed down with a cross on his back. He bowed down with crowds of thorns around his head. In order to lift your bowed down head You've got to look at the one who bowed down for you. He became a little lower than angels. That's a bowed down man. He bowed down with a cross on his back. He was bent over. I, they tell me one man grabbed him and tried to help him. But you can't help Jesus. You have to appreciate him. He said, must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? There's a cross for everyone. Surely there's a cross for you and me. That's why he bowed down walking up on Calvary. But they made a mistake. He wasn't bowed down too long. They made a mistake and lifted him up. They lifted him up. He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men under me. 
That's when he called you by your name. He said, come here, Galen. Come here, deacons. Come here, members. Come here, choir. I died for you. Third Avenue, thou art loose. I'm trying to fix next Sunday worship. Third Avenue, thou art loose. I'm making the same declaration. It's just an inf a spirit of infirmity. God has already forgiven you. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died and God raised him from the dead, there's no more infirmity in you. By his stripes I'm healed. And since I'm healed, that means I'm walking a little better. That means I ain't bowed bow down anymore. That's means I'm not bowed over anymore. I'm standing up and walking for the king. The woman who had this issue, she was bent over, but she wasn't broken. She was caught under the spirit of this evil infirmity never to realize that she had already been set free. <laughs> Just remember, sometimes we get sick, but we're not broken. Sometimes it looks bad, but it's for your good. Sometimes we come to church, not because we're caught up in sin, but it's because we haven't released ourselves from what God has delivered us from. And I tell you all the time, sometimes you're your own worst enemy. Can I show you something else in my closing with this? The Bible didn't tell us that this woman was caught up with the spirit infirmity by the devil. That's all I wanted to tell you. I thought you'd figure out the rest. It wasn't the devil who had her this way. It was herself. Many Christians can't say hallelujah, can't say thank you, Jesus. And they're using the Flip Wilson excuse, the devil made me do it. And it's not the devil. At the name of Jesus, demons tremble, and Satan has to flee. And we've been calling on the name of Jesus ever since we've been here. So if you're going through this infirmity, if you've got this guilt trip on yourself, it ain't the devil because he ain't here. I know what we say sometimes, the devil comes to church just as much as anybody else. But you know what I've learned? He might come to church with you, but he ain't going to stay. Only way he get a chance to stay is Jesus leave. So I'm going to put this, this is for, this is a radio message. This ain't for Third Avenue. If Satan is coming to church and he's sitting in your pews or sitting in your pulpit, that's because you did not invite Jesus to the service. They will not dwell in the same place. God won't dwell in an unclean temple. And I tell you, every time Jesus shows up, he brings a broom with him. He discards all trash and all sin and all ungodly behavior. There is no way that you're going to trust him and allow him to control your life. And you're going to walk in a spirit of infirmity and walk in a way of unrighteousness. Now, I do know that sometimes we do things that are not uh, right in the eyesight of God. But can I tell you when you do those? When you ignore Jesus. Because if you obey him. You think he going to lead you wrong? I'm through preaching now. You did good today. You stayed up through the whole message. <laughs> the spirit of infirmity. You can't lay it off on the devil. Did you notice through the scripture that we didn't mention the devil? We don't read about him. 
I'm trying to get y'all to say hallelujah. I'm doing my best. Every time we preach, we don't have to bring up the devil. And the more you preach without the devil, the more you ought to rejoice. Because if you don't have to call on the name or call on the devil or uh, identify the devil, that means that you're living closer to God. Third Avenue, I always told you how much I love you. Can I tell you why I love you so much? It's because you have drawn closer to God. And as long as you draw closer to God, I know that you're going to treat me right. And I'm going to tell you something else. You ain't got to worry about your pastor treating you right because I've been calling on the name of Jesus. And in my calling on the name of Jesus, Satan said, well, let me find another church to attend. Because them folks over there keep drawing close to Jesus, and I have nothing that I can get away with over there. I told you, I'm going to lift you up. I ain't going to tear you down. I thank God for Third Avenue, because when I walk in Third Avenue, I've never walked in here, and somebody ain't walked up to me and said, Pastor, I'm praying for you and your family. Pastor, I thank you for the word of God. Not thank me for being who I am, but thank you for teaching and preaching the word of God. You don't know how that lifts me up. And you don't know how that makes me pray just a little more. Now I learn you by name. Now when I sit down, your face comes to my mind. And I called on God on your behalf. Now, And every now and then, I'll ask for some stuff that I didn't think about. And it's because God said they need this and they need that. But I just want to hear your voice because you're acting like a pastor now. And when you act like a pastor, them people are going to act like they love you. And when they act like they love you, everything is going to be all right. I know it ain't good preaching, but I just got to testify now. I'm so glad that I'm in a place where Jesus is lifted up and Jesus is Lord of the house. I'm so glad I ain't got to put on a facade. I can just be who I am. I'm so glad that I can just walk like I normally walk. And it pleases God. I'm so glad that the people can come and hug me, hold my hand, and let me know that they've heard what God has to say. I don't know about you, but that means something to me. It means all the world to me. Because you know what else I, I rejoice in? One day I've got to leave this place. One day I've got to go on the other side of Calvary. You know why I really rejoice? When I get over there, I know that if you're not already over there, you're on your way. God bless you. 